Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. We're coming at you from the SCI convention in Nashville with Swe- with Seth Swerzik. I almost said that totally wrong from the yeah. get-go. It's a tongue twister. Actually, how do you really say your last name? Uh, so I was hunting in Germany with uh, several people, one of which was from Poland, and that's where uh, my uh, grandparents were from on the Swerzik side. And he said, uh, I asked him how you pronounce your name, and it's Schwachuk. Yeah, well, I can't say that. Yeah. We're uh, very uh, rural Nebraskans, and we're Swerzik. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, if you guys are fans of Hornady, just like I am, you probably are already following Seth on the Hornady podcast. Um, it's tremendously successful, very popular, and it's a great resource for you guys to learn about everything new from Hornady, but also, like, those of you that are wanting, like, that nitty-gritty, super detailed ballistics information that's where you go uh, because this man in, in the team at Hornady, they're, I mean, this is what they do all day long. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. And that's true. You know, from a, a, a participation level standpoint, when you look at Hornady and our employees, mm-hmm. the average employee wakes up, comes to work with their nose to the stone, go to church on Sunday, raise the kids and they shoot guns. Mm-hmm. That's what we do as a culture. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in our ballistic development group, the team that kind of handles new product development, we are passionate users yeah. of the product. Yeah. We're out there hunting, we're testing, we're competing. And, uh, you know, one, we're passionate about what we do. Two, we've learned a lot of things because it's the information age. You know, with yeah. the Doppler radar and some smart engineers, mm-hmm. we, we've had a good run of, mm-hmm. of learning some stuff. And then, you know, we have we feel like we have an obligation to get that information out to our consumers because if we make the best bullets in the world, the most accurate ammo ever made, if you miss what you're aiming at because, one, you don't understand how to use the product uh, or because you're using the wrong tools for the job, it doesn't matter how good the product was exactly if you right. missed. So uh, the podcast has been a great platform to get that really deep technical dive into our product line mm-hmm. into some theoreticals and just some rabbit higher hole. level yeah. rabbit holing yeah. they're rabbit holing they're going to take it all the way under yeah. the earth and yeah. dig everything out yeah. so, so that's what you guys are wanting internal and external ballistics yeah. um yeah it's been a great a, a great time being part of the podcast for sure yeah no and i'm sure every day you're you know challenging you know theories and one of the things you kind of blew my mind at shot show not to go down like a huge rabbit hole but we were talking about your reloading mm-hmm. and how you're like well it doesn't have to be quite as exact as we once thought yep. and and there's so many people that i kind of looked up to in reloading and, and reloading you know preston Lentford and i did a great segment for super high level basic mm-hmm. um that you were uh, you know your team helped us produce and put together on you know the basics of reloading and it's always been so intimidating because i always feel like why well, it has to be like this super exact and and perhaps i'm not quite knowledgeable enough to get there but it doesn't really sound like that's the case from what you're discovering yeah that's really not the case you can set yourself up to have really accurate reloads uh, right out of the gate if you choose a cartridge that has chamber dimensions that lend themselves to just overall accuracy like Mm -hmm. one of the creedmoor or one of the arcs or one of the prc cartridges Mm -hmm. where the dimensions and the tolerances of a standard sammy chamber really lend themselves to accuracy Mm -hmm. then you pick a really accurate bullet uh with a really forgiving shape and like our eld family the eld match the eldx and the new eld vt bullet 
uh, they're very tolerant of how far they jump into the rifling. Mm -hmm. And so you can set yourself up for success right out of the gate for accuracy just by checking those boxes. And then, like you mentioned, we've learned a lot of things about do you have to trickle propellant so that you're measuring each individual kernel? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of people that used to do that, and there's still people that do that today. And as we're learning in large sample size testing, it simply doesn't matter as yeah. much as we used to think. Yeah, and that really helps, you know, someone who is interested in taking up reloading for the economic, for the personal you know, pleasure of doing it or mm -hmm. just for a great pastime in the winter months. Um, it kind of takes that level of intimidation out of, hey, there is some margin of error as long as I'm getting the reloading manual and I'm following these specifications and I'm setting up everything right, I can go out there and I can be successful. Absolutely. It's safe. It's fun. It's enjoyable. And once you get started in it, it you can slip down that slope very, very quickly with spending money and buying tools. Or you can keep it really entry level and mm -hmm. you can still create some remarkably accurate and and consistent ammunition with just some basic tools so huge spectrum uh, you know yeah. you can go from one end to the other but um, just getting started in it is half the battle it's well, just, just and get started if you're like me also and you just don't have that time yet in your life or it's not something that you want to aspire to it hornady makes great factory ammunition, the match ammunition, hunting ammunition. I mean, you guys are manufacturing with exacting standards and um, your inspection process is, is second to none. You guys do an incredible yeah. job there. And um, so, you know, you can trust that, you know, if you take a box of match ammo and you go to any competition, if that's what you're wanting to do, or if you're just wanting to sit at the bench and shoot some great groups, um, you know, that ammunition is going to get you there. Yeah. You, you know, I used to be a staunch advocate for, I have to hand load everything all mm -hmm. the time. And largely it's because I grew up hand loading and I was proficient at it. And, you know, like you mentioned with time, you know, you start throwing in this, that, and the other thing. And now it's like, oh, I got a match coming up. Didn't load for it. I'm shooting factory ammo yep. and I'm shooting better now than I did when I was yeah. hand loading everything. So as an industry, we've come a long way with propellant technology, bullet accuracy, cartridge design, the range finders, you know, those are more accurate. Mm -hmm. Scopes are better. Barrels mm -hmm. are better. Everything's better uh, to give you a chance at accuracy. Yeah. And so is it, you know, with the propellant, you know, that not that mixture, that recipe, you know, down to the kernel accuracy isn't what you're saying as important as we once thought. Mm -hmm. Does that also lend itself to like a bigger shift in like our standard deviations that you're going to see across the board? Or um, is that it, still pretty consistent if you're within, you know, a, a, a grain or two? So it would be usually about a half a grain would okay. be where we'd want to live. You start getting outside of half a grain into full grain, okay. you know, swings. You'll you'll see a, a problem there, uh, or you can see a quote unquote problem. There's standard deviation has also been kind of largely misunderstood. Mm -hmm. If you don't shoot enough shots uh, to get to a to to, to fill out your your uh, normal distribution, mm -hmm. standard deviation can be very. Uh, misleading. Mm -hmm. So if you don't shoot at least 30 shots, which is kind of the standard for um, scientific method, if you know 30 is kind of the minimum sample. Mm -hmm. um, Versus the three to five shot group that a lot of us are kind of traditionally, mm -hmm. hey, I shot a three shot group, this is great, or I shot a five shot group. You know, what you're saying is if you really want to establish that baseline, yep. we need to be burning through a box. Plus they sell ammo, so uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just well, it's, teasing. It's not just uh, for that. And yeah. actually, if you if you if you shoot a little bit more at the beginning, you'll end up shooting less later on. You know, if you shoot, a, you know, a, let's say you do a 20 shot zero and you mm -hmm. get velocity on 20 rounds. So you have a 20 shot zero and a 20 shot average of your velocity. Mm -hmm. You'll be way further ahead. You'll hit what you're aiming at more often mm -hmm. at long range. Uh, and you won't be chasing your tail because your rifle zero, you know, you said it was 100, but it was actually 103. Yeah. Well, by the time you get to half a mile and you're trying to hit a piece of steel, mm -hmm. that three-yard difference makes a difference. And if you have your velocity average off by a little bit, that can make a difference, too. Yeah. So you shoot a little more at the beginning, but you'll end up shooting less, and you won't chase your tail as much mm -hmm. down the road. Yeah, and that velocity number, we see that at distance. A lot of people, you know, there's a couple of trains of thought with, you know, establishing what is accurate at distance some people adjust their velocity mm -hmm. and some people adjust the bc on the bullet and mm -hmm. and so there's a couple ways to mathematically bend why we're hitting where we're hitting and i mean i can see if you actually spend the time and do that 20 shot group get that 20 shot velocity average there's going to be less margin of error at distance yeah. just naturally yep and I, a few moments ago i mentioned how about you know the 
barrels and rangefinders and scopes and all of this stuff has gotten better and better. So have chronographs. Yeah. And now for six hundred dollars, I can put a Doppler radar mm-hmm. in my back pocket, mm-hmm. and I well, can. Well, Garmin just yeah, came out the with Garmin the, Zero, and yeah. the Lab Radar just came out with another yeah. size, a small one. So if you have that tool. And you know with a Doppler radar what your muzzle velocity is. There's no reason to lie to a ballistic calculator mm-hmm. when that's a number that you actually know. So, yeah, just it's been fun to see the industry get better and better and better and better. And our ability to shoot smaller and smaller targets at longer and longer ranges mm-hmm. has gotten so much easier. With and it's a lot of fun. Too. Well, and your bullet designs, you know, they've, yeah. they've improved. You, We've got these nice boat tail designs that are great in the wind. And you guys have introduced some new cartridges this year. You know, I'm a big fan of the ELDX. I've been shooting that for years in hunting applications. We're shooting it at matches. But now you have the VT, which is your varmint target. And explain to everybody kind of where where this was born from and and what that brings to the marketplace. Sure. So uh, it's in our ELD family. So what that means is extreme low drag. So it's got a long boat tail and it's got a long uh, ogive because that's going to help us with the shape of the bullet to lower the drag. The VT, where that falls is... We knew and we've known for a while that we can manipulate the internal geometry of the bullet, like where the lead is. And lead is very dense. Mm -hmm. And uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the VT puts the mass in the ass of the bullet. It shifts the center of gravity rearward. To the back. Yep. And that helps a couple things. One, it moves center pressure rearward. So in a gyroscopically stable bullet, a more rearward center of gravity will have uh, generally better dynamic stability mm-hmm. and there's that you, we can talk in great detail about that but it gets pretty in the weeds uh, but if you've heard of a bullet going to sleep that go to sleep is dynamic stability where the nose yaw pattern is either staying the same or getting progressively smaller as a function of time and distance uh, and so that'll help with dynamic stability and what it also does is it reduces the weight because mm-hmm. lead is very, very dense so we cut some of the weight out there so now you have the shape of an extremely low drag bullet but you have the weight of like a varmint bullet and you now are getting increased speed yeah you get higher muzzle velocity and the third thing it does for us puts a big air cavity up front and when you hit something like a coyote that polymer tip sets back into that Mm -hmm. air cavity and that thing will come apart like a hand grenade so it's win 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 uh so you're going to see bullets that are not light for caliber they're going to be light for length so they're light for length they still require a, a relatively fast twist rate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you look at cartridges that we've introduced or helped introduce, you know, you've got cartridges like all of the arcs, the 6 arc, the new 22 arc, the Creed Moors, mm-hmm. um, the 6.5 Grindle, some of those that have the twist rate to shoot these long mm-hmm. bullets. What are these, like one and eights? Or are they so, getting yeah, short? like the 22 is a 62 grain bullet, and it's not like any 62 grain bullet you've ever seen. It's incredibly long. That requires a one and eight. Mm-hmm. The 80 grain bullet in 6 millimeter also requires a one and eight. Mm-hmm. And the 100 grain bullet in 6.5, Five also requires a one and eight, mm-hmm. um, and the the big one for us is the thirty cal. That's the heaviest one we make. It's a one seventy four, mm-hmm. and that requires about eleven and a quarter. You know, you might be able to get away with it in a twelve, but an eleven and a quarter or a ten twist is really where this thing's going to thrive or faster. And firearms manufacturers like Ruger are leading the charge with okay, we're now going to start manufacturing firearms like the new Ruger Gen 2 American is now available in the new 22 ARC. Yep. And so that's going to lend itself to extreme performance on that varmint side too on your bolt rifles and oh, what yeah. you want to carry. In. This thing is, yeah, the, that, that rifle platform, uh, it's an affordable rifle. They all shoot well. Yes. You pair it with the 22 ARC and you've got long range mm-hmm. varmint performance ready to go. And the ARC has plenty of match application, but it was purpose built with long-range coyotes in mind Mm -hmm. and yeah those those new ruger americans they did a wonderful job refining the original american design aesthetically they just look oh they're sexy rifles oh they look good and it's got a short enough barrel you can throw your suppressor on the end of it and make it really fun to shoot and you know have around all the time you know and you're not having to worry about hearing protection muzzle brakes things like that. yeah the shorter barrels are great and not to just fanboy on on ruger but you could take the same rifle and you at five foot one or two and me at five 11 can shoot the same rifle because they put the adjustable length of pull yeah. goes from 12 inches to almost 14 that's inches right. length of pull mm-hmm. so that's super great and again the shorter barrels for the suppressors is just awesome it is an awesome that is a really kick-ass package and um, I, I did some hunting with mine last year but it was chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor mm. which you know 
the cartridge whole, you'll never catch that on. cartridge uh, yeah I, actually literally that cartridge what 12 years ago when you guys introduced it it might have been 13 years ago now That's um 2007 so, so 8 2008 yeah so when you guys introduced that you revolutionized the the firearms manufacturing process the way we think about ammunition the thing the way we think about bullet performance yeah. the way we think about recoil all of yeah. these things that were industry standard for since the dawn of you know firearms um was completely redefined and yeah. and and since then you guys are still redefining now uh, you know next came that 65 prc um, which i i hunted with in 2022 with tremendous success loved it and then this year i started shooting the seven yeah. and holy smokes every time i think it can get better it does uh, it's gonna be hard to get better than a seven prc yeah. for utilitarian big game That's you right. in wyoming you've got animals from obviously coyotes you know in the back 40 but you know on the big game side you have everything from antelope to, to moose. moose bighorn sheep yeah, elk everything. white-tailed deer mule deer and one cartridge can do it all in the 7 prc mm -hmm. you know it's as far as magnums go it's moderate recoil mm -hmm. ultra flat mm -hmm. hits like a hammer oh yeah bucks the wind like nobody's business there's just so much to like about that cartridge uh that yeah it's going to be hard to beat so why do you think in your guys's opinion why that seven's catching on more than let's say like the 300 prc is out there like i shoot mm -hmm. at long range um in my like elr comp competitions where i'm shooting you know 2,000 yards some of those really extreme ranges um and i feel like you know more people are lending themselves to the seven right now like there's this huge push around the seven is it just that the 300's been around for a while and it's kind of quieted down or do you think that people are just excited about what's latest and greatest yeah. um i think this is total speculation uh i think that uh you know to relate it to like carpentry or something like you know there are hammers mm -hmm. and do different hammers do different jobs and, yeah. and you can use one hammer to do them all but you know if you've got like a 14 ounce little finishing hammer and a, you know a 22 mm -hmm. ounce just general hammer mm -hmm. and then you got like a 32 ounce framer well the the 300 PRC is like a framing hammer or, yeah. you know, a pound and a half sledgehammer. Like, you only need that hammer for certain jobs. It can mm -hmm. do a lot of them, mm -hmm. but it's a lot. It's a lot mm -hmm. of recoil. Uh, and I say a lot. It's it's compared to a 338 or yeah. some of the bigger stuff, yeah. it's more manageable. But it is substantial recoil compared to a 7 or a 6.5. And you don't need all of that energy and velocity all of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going uh, elk hunting in, say, or, or let's say you're hunting mule deer in region g of wyoming and you know like that is a, a premier region or in years past it has been i know winter kill's been bad but if you run into a grizzly bear yeah i would rather have a big 30 even yeah. though i don't need the 30 to hunt deer so there are reasons for that tool big moose you know you go to alaska to hunt moose great option or you're on a brown bear hunt mm -hmm. but i feel like the seven is about 30% less recoil than the 300. It's a lot more finesse to shooting it. Yeah, so the 30% the less recoil when you go to the 7. So that's great. Mm -hmm. You've got more than enough bullet to shoot any animal in North America at any range most people are hunting at. Yeah. And it's just past the click. It's just a little bit bigger than the 6.5. Yeah. And some people feel that the 6.5 is a little on the smaller side for an animal like an elk, let's say. So it just pl splits the gap so yeah. beautifully. Uh, it's, it's not overwhelmingly hard to handle mm -hmm. from a shootability standpoint mm -hmm. and again you get all the benefits that everybody wants these days accuracy long yeah. range potential plenty of energy and velocity on target mm -hmm. wind drift like nobody's business mm -hmm. uh, and you put it all in a compact cartridge that you can you can shoot from a 22 inch barrel and you're not going to hamstring it well and i'm really excited ruger just came out with their ftw hunter mm -hmm. chambered in the seven and um they have it now with a uh, a brand new custom stock from HS Precision, and it is a beautiful rifle. It's going to shoot remarkably well, and so that is a new release for this year, and I'm really excited to get that and hunt with that this year. I had them chamber me a uh, 7 last year on a Ruger American. It was like a secret gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, we don't make this yet. I'm like, well, make it for me, please. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I shot it last year, and I just had great success with it and really loved it. Um, and I had been such a fan of the 6.5 PRC already. Like, mm -hmm. But I, before 6.5 PRC, you couldn't pry a 6.5 Creedmoor out of my hands. 
And like yeah. I said, it's like it's like a little bit of an addiction. Like you get a little bit of one, and then the next one's better, and the next one's better. And like, where yeah. do you stop? This you is, have to have one of each. You have to have least. them all. Uh, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And then now, for on the varmint side, you know, Yogi and I have been going down to to Texas and doing a lot of pig hunting in this new 22 ARC, mm-hmm. which stands for Advanced Rifle Cartridge, uh, because it is extremely accurate. Um, I, man, I can't wait to give that a shot. It's, it's, that's going to be an incredible game changer as well over the traditional 5.56. Yeah, you get heavier bullets, flatter trajectory, less wind deflection, uh, still in a, you know, a platform that you can run in an AR-15, a small mm-hmm. frame AR-15. So that just, it's going to lend itself to a lot of use. It's at home in a bolt gun, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. the Ruger Gen 2. But yeah, on the AR side, this thing is fast. Yeah. And they say speed kills because it does. So what are you talking velocity? Over three? So, yeah, we've got three bullet options. Uh, the, the smallest or the lightest weight is our 62-grain bullet in the V-match line, which is new this year. That at the muzzle of a 24-inch barrel is doing 3,300 feet per second. Ooh, uh, smoking fast. The 75 grain is doing 3075, and the 88-grain bullet is doing 2825. Okay. So a, a big span of bullet yeah. weights, but that 62 has the same shape, or very similar shape, rather, to our 75 grain ELD match. Yeah. So you get the shape benefits of those really low drag bullets, but the lighter weight, that's how you get higher muzzle velocity. So it really does give you 22250 performance, mm-hmm. uh, not out of sheer speed like the 22250, because a 55 grain bullet in the old 250 is going to be doing about 3680 mm-hmm. to 3700, mm-hmm. but they're flat base shorter OGI bullets. So let's let the efficiency of the bullet do the work. So this is going to have nearly the same trajectory within about an inch out to 500. Past 500, the arc is actually flatter than a 22250, and it's going to have about, I don't know, 30% less wind deflection. Yeah, so, so this is a game changer for long range varmint hunting. And and you were talking also a little bit about some night coyote hunting. Oh and, my gosh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's going to be a game changer for if that as well. Your listeners haven't done it. It, I mean, it almost feels like you're doing something borderline illegal. Like <laughs> something this fun shouldn't, like, it should, how is this legal to go out and hunt coyotes yeah. at night, especially in like, Mid-February is mm-hmm. kind of the, the sweet spot because mm-hmm. it's mating season, so they're super responsive yeah. to calls. They're getting territorial. It's usually cold, so obviously they're on their feet for food. And with night hunting, especially with you know thermal or night vision, range estimation is one of two things, really difficult or really expensive. So in an effort to not go the really expensive route, yeah. you got to have a flat trajectory. Yeah, that's right. So this really lends itself to that flat trajectory. And the other thing, with these 62-grain bullets with that big air cavity we talked about, you shoot a coyote inside of 300 yards. You just shoot. You don't yeah, have to yeah. worry. You're not going to see any difference from a traditional bullet at 300. Past 300 yards, you start shooting coyotes at four, five, 600 yards with a 22-250 and a traditional varmint bullet, you can hit them, but it's not as authoritative as you mm-hmm. think. Something like this new VT, it anchors coyotes at every range because of that hyper dramatic expansion Mm -hmm. and it's a little bit heavier bullet yeah well no that's that's exactly what you want you want that expansion to stop them yeah yeah and long bullets high sectional density compared to a traditional varmint bullet and just better penetration it it's just all things that are good for a coyote hunter that's awesome and also you guys are come up with the v match this year as well this Mm -hmm. is new from and 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 this is going to be your extreme precision what now why would somebody choose the v match over the 22 or over an arc cartridge well the v match is a line of ammo that does house our arc cartridges so you can get that there the v match we came out with the vt bullet because okay we we know we can maximize aerodynamics and increase muzzle velocity let's do that and it has plenty of match applications so that's what we have a bullet that's awesome well if you're gonna have a bullet that cool you got to have a line of ammo because yeah. not everybody hand loads. So the V-Match line, the bullets are held to our accuracy standard that sh- is shared with ELD Match and mm-hmm. ATIP. So it shoots mm-hmm. our match accuracy standard, just like the ELDX hunting bullet. And it's in a line of ammo that's useful for long-range varmints, or you can shoot it for a match. So the V-Match line kind of made sense. It's available in 22 arc, 6 arc, 6.5 Grendel, 6 Creed, and 6.5 Creed. And it uses our brand new VT bullet. So you guys have literally about everything that you would want for yeah. for that application. Yeah, I'm excited in years, you know, forthcoming that that line will continue to round out. But for the initial launch in 2024, mm-hmm. yeah, if you've got one of those cartridges and you're shooting varmints or you may be shooting some PRS style matches, it's an easy button. It's mm-hmm. you're gonna shoot well. It's fast, flat, mm-hmm. accurate. Yeah, and that six ARC is something that a lot of people have been shooting in that in mm-hmm. that field for quite a number of years now, yep. and having it available 
from the factory is just really a time saver. It is, yeah. We've the the six arc instant success, obviously with the DoD adoption and some specialized groups, uh, but commercially, uh, I've been shooting it for PRS. A bunch of us on the Hornady team have. Mm -hmm. She's been shooting it for coyotes. She's been shooting it a, a ton, mm -hmm. and we always had the request for a varmint option, mm -hmm. and. The easy button for us could have been we have existing VMAX bullets, and VMAXs are great bullets. So we could have just plugged in an old bullet. But this is such a new cartridge and a new design. Let's design a bullet specifically for these new cartridges. And so that's what we did with the VT, and that's going to help the 6 arc, you know, go into that varmint line even further. Because, again, for coyotes, it's, it's an awesome one. Well, and that's what keeps Hornady moving forward in your world of ammunition and precision shooting is that you're always making what is great even greater. And you're, you're not meeting the standard. You're creating the standard. You're breaking the ceilings. And you guys are constantly innovating. And your team is out there, your end users, like you said, you're out there hunting. You guys are out there shooting you're competing you're doing it and um, you know you make the you know people like you know the rest of us that are just out there like in Wyoming yeah. out there hunting hunting coyotes hunting spring black bear hunting whatever elk mule deer white tail you're making it easy for us when we get that shot we make we make it count yeah that's feel, it feels good to, to be a part of that and again as an end user and as a lifelong hunter to have that confidence of oh I, you know I used to handle it everything I hunted with and now I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm using factory precision hunter ammo and I have just as much, if not more, confidence now than I ever have. When you finally get that shot, you earn that shot, and uh, you just to have confidence in it, it's just it feels good to pull the trigger when you know exactly where that bullet's going, and you know exactly what it's going to do when it gets there. Yeah, well, and, and if you're a reloader, you've been through the whole process of getting it there in the first place, which is also really rewarding. Yeah, it is. That's you know, I'm I'm a weirdo, but usually when I'm if I do reload for a hunt. I'm going to reload 20 rounds. I'll pick a bullet out of the 20 and I'll set it aside. And then I'll load that one last. And that'll be the first one that goes on the top of the magazine. So when I close the bolt on a live round, that's the one. And I picked it out before I made the ammo. And I don't know why, but it just feels really, uh, I don't know, it's cool to have that much satisfaction and control over the whole process. Mm -hmm. I like that. No, that's, uh, that's great. If you guys are out there and you're wanting to learn more about Hornady New Product, if you guys are wanting to just deep dive into all things ammunition, and firearms. Seth is the expert. He's hosting that um, podcast and we want to invite you guys. It's basically available anywhere you download yeah. or stream podcasts now. Yep. Uh, but you're doing a video version too? Yeah, so and ironically uh, the, the podcast gets a significant amount more views on YouTube than it will get downloads on audio only format and mm -hmm. we take a lot of pride in what we do and, and everything we do and with the podcast included we're filming three cameras in 4K Post editing lights. I mean, we we try to do a very very good job on the audio and video side. And yeah, the YouTube videos are out there. Uh, they're just on the Hornady uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Obviously, out there in, in uh, audio form only. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, some of our more popular videos somewhere between 100 and 250 thousand views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of odd to see you know that many people will watch four dudes talk at a table, but mm -hmm. they do. And uh, we're happy to put that stuff out. And it's mm -hmm. been a great platform to get out information, uh, education about our products, selecting the right product, because mm -hmm. that's a question we get all the time. Yeah. You've got three PRCs, you've got the CX, you've got the ELDX, what bullet do I choose? And so we've addressed a lot of those on the podcast. Yeah, and that is, especially, you know, when you start doing a lot of international travel as well, you know, I, in in North America, I hunt a lot with, you know, our ELD Precision Hunter line. ELDX Precision Hunter line, but when we go to more dangerous game, you know, Hornady's got some solids and some oh, dangerous yeah. game, and, and then we need to look at different things, and so that podcast will really kind of help you drive and decide where you want to go if you want to shoot outfitter ammo and get that monolithic component, or yeah. if you want to stay with a lead bullet, and, and so it'll really help you kind of make that purchase and that make that decision really easy for you. And I know it's a great resource for myself because it's hard to keep track or up with all of this technology oh, sure. um, when you don't do it every day like you guys are doing it um, in Grand Island. So. Yeah, that's been, yeah, that's huge. And another thing, another fold into the podcast world is, uh, you know, I'm new to the marketeering world, but it, 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 the interaction, the interaction mm -hmm. with the direct consumer of the product mm -hmm. and with the podcast, they can email us at podcast at mm -hmm. They can comment in the YouTube comments and, you know, we obviously we can't respond to everything, but we do a, 
uh, we do try to, you know, if there's some, uh, legitimate questions that need answered, we can interact right there and get different podcast suggestions, product suggestions. Yeah. So the interaction with the end user has been great too. Yeah. And everybody has an opinion and, and, and likes to give it. So it's, I'm sure yeah. it's a, <laughs> so take that with a, that's always good, you know, and that's, that's what leads the innovation too, is customers coming out, end users coming out and saying, Hey, you guys, have you ever thought about doing this? Because, you know, that one seed might plant the innovation for something completely industry yeah. changing like six, five Creedmoor was, you know, yeah. um, it just takes a conversation just takes a conversation so i invite you guys to check out the hornady podcast go onto their youtube channel um, and i appreciate all of you for tuning in to us here at um sci convention in nashville tennessee and i appreciate your time and if you guys have any questions hornady has an excellent customer service team they're there to help you the people there that answer the phone they know their stuff and uh, can help you you know answer questions from reloading to bullet selection whatever your question is you know give that customer service team a call as well if you need to um, or just get on their website superinteractivehornady.com uh, get online check them out and uh, you guys will be happy on your next big game hunt or your next trip to the range wherever wherever you're going you're going to want Hornady ammunition right on so and happy anniversary 75 years 75 years of accurate deadly dependable we it's got that wild. going on right now yeah 75 years family owned and still very heavily family involved you know, yeah. it's been family owned. Uh, there was a tragedy in 1981 where the, you know, the president's seat, uh, Joyce Hornady, our founder, was killed. Uh, his son, Steve, and, and the family stepped up. Mm -hmm. And it's still family owned. Steve shows up to work every day. Yeah. He's in his office. He's in meetings. And his son, Jason, now our vice president, uh, very involved in yeah. the day-to-day -day operations of Hornady. And it's a great family to work for. And I am very confident, you know, with Jason's kids in line and passionate about hunting and shooting, it'll be another 75 years for sure. Yeah, well, we won't be around for that, but no. uh, the next generation will sure benefit from that. And everything that you guys are doing right now, innovating and leading the industry of hunting and shooting sports, I can't thank you enough for Absolutely. everything that you guys are doing in your time. And uh, again, you guys, you know where to go now, and we'll see you there. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter Ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments. Look no further than Hornady Outfitter Ammunition. You guys, if you're like me, you are totally dependent on OnX Hunt for nearly everything from hunting, navigating backcountry roads, even real estate. But being an elite member with OnX has so many benefits that you guys are going to want to take advantage of if you're not already doing so. For example, you're going to have access to all 50 states plus Canada with tons of valuable resource, landowner information, and you're also going to get added benefits like draw odds with top ret that will help you with all of your application seasons and benefits through hunting full magazine and to boot you guys they've got tons of great specials through partners like silencer central where if you're an on x elite member you really benefit from those partnerships so if you guys aren't a member i encourage you go online to the on x hunt website use code wild 20 at checkout and you're going to save 20 percent you're going to love being an on X Hunt Elite member. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are coming at you from the SCI convention in Nashville, Tennessee 
at the Women Go Hunt booth and I'm with a champion for conservation and women and just an all around fantastic spokesperson, Gabriella Hoffman, host of the District of Conservation podcast. Gabriella is based in Washington, D.C. and literally has her thumb on the pulse of politics with conservation, uh, outdoors, all things Second Amendment. And you are a fierce fierce person out there like getting your voice heard getting our agenda on the dockets of legislators and decision makers and really really fighting for us so that's such a high compliment you. coming from you and <laughs> being a friend of yours all these years I think for the better part of like almost eight years now yeah, and I'm I'm well, equally complimentary of you you do phenomenal you. work so it's good to talk to you Christy I think we met at SHOT Show it, it was the NRA like, show in Louisville. Oh, it was NRA. Yes, okay, I couldn't yes. remember. I knew it was one either one of those shot shows. or NRA. And it was um it's been such a it's been such a pleasure to watch everything that you're doing because number one, you're so well informed. Your family has a very um, colorful background of yes, immigration. Yes, you've met my dad. Yes, you know. and I and I love <laughs> that because um, you have such an in depth perspective on um, policy from so many standpoints, not of just an American view, but also an international perspective of looking at different policy as it relates to foreign policy and domestic policy as well. And and what you're doing for women and championing women is, is incredible. I'm trying. And I can't be the only person to do it. And, you know, hearing my family's story briefly for your audience and listeners, people don't know how good we have it here in the United States Amen. for many things, but especially as it relates to conservation. Mm -hmm. Your husband knows coming from Europe, mm -hmm. very restrictive as to what you can do, can't yes. do. Here we have public waters, public lands. We have multiple uses. Yes. We have so many wonderful things here and people either don't understand it, don't appreciate it, or they try to regulate people off lands. Or they also just assume that everywhere in the world is like it is here, yes. which it is not. No. And we don't want everything to be a national park. I love national parks, but we have sometimes a misunderstanding of what conservation looks like yeah. in this country. And so people conflate with preservation. Some preservation is good, but total preservation mm -hmm. and rewilding, not very good. And that's yeah. what's happening in Europe. And what we see happen in Europe could happen here if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. That's why SEI is great with really having the pulse on different policies. And I just try to disseminate, you know, what SEI does, all these other mm -hmm. groups do, and then do my own research for things that are not currently being covered or that deserve more attention. And so, yes, my family background certainly does influence yeah. my kind of worldview in thinking with respect to policy, but also my love of the outdoors. You met my dad. My dad taught me how to fish. And yeah. so that was how my love of the outdoors was first fomented and first started. So started with fishing then shooting sports when I turned 19, then hunting officially when I became 26, and now I'm in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a natural progression to do all these other activities. I mean, I already had a basis. I just didn't have the access yeah. in California, you know, wasn't really talked about to do guns and mm -hmm. hunting, although it did exist. Yeah. Uh, but I did have it planted in my head, you know, to do these things. And in Lithuania, where my parents are from, is a very outdoorsy yeah. country. There's a lot of nature. My dad does a lot of like mushroom hunting. Yeah. Um, there's so much different wildlife. I was talking to your husband before we went on the air and he's like, yeah, it's kind of like a hidden gem Lithuania. I haven't gone hunting there. And I was like, yeah, there's like a lot of like roe mm -hmm. deer and red stag, mm -hmm. great fishing too. It's just something waiting to be explored. And I still need to do it myself because um, I haven't been back to the country in 20 something years. But it's, yeah, it's just, you know, being a first generation American, kind of observing what's happening, you know, politically, especially as it comes to conservation, um, immersing myself in these activities, you know, even being policy, media, all this, like what a lot of people who cover these topics outside of, let's say, our sphere, who are not endemic, they don't have a direct connection. They're not immersed in the industry, yeah. whether it's hunting or fishing. And then they're lecturing and writing to people, this is how hunting is, or this is how conservation is. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think around the time you and I first became friends, that's when I was really starting to write about what's the truth about hunting, what does conservation yes. look like, and really interviewing people who know a lot more than me educating me about everything and, and learning everything as I go with the laws and, and the you know, procedures and the ethics of the North American model. And so I have to learn, of course, and even though I know a lot of ne things now, I still have to educate myself on certain things and, and everyone should, you're always At learning. A hundred percent. Well, and I think for the listeners too, we really need to draw a very clear and definitive line. When we talk about conservation politics, there is a huge difference in the word conservation versus the word preservation. And we walk a very fine line. Preservation is preserving, untouching, leaving it 
undisturbed by man. Conservation is having a man-made influence to utilize that natural resources to its highest and best practices. That can mean reforestation, that can mean water improvement projects, where like preservation on the other hand is a hands-off philosophy of environmental politics and it's it's very very important yes. that we're very careful on how we use our words and our terminology when we talk about a conservation approach versus preservation mm -hmm. approach but we see the antis taking that conservation lingo and claiming it as their own it's Correct. very dangerous to see this and then they're like well this is conservation and hunting is disturbing conservation or ruining it and i think to myself i'm like that is not true because of all the funding that comes yeah. from Pittman robertson dingle johnson um, everyone has acknowledged it and we've even had kind of middle of the road kind of observers and environmental or natural resources policy say, yeah, actually hunters are needed on the landscape. Shooting sports enthusiasts are needed on the landscape because they're the dri largest drivers of funding to these activities. So some are so waking up So pausing on that. Yes. yes. Dingell Johnson and Pittman Robertson, that is a self-imposed tax that hunters and anglers have put on the themselves manufacturing process yes. basically of firearms uh, fishing tackle equipment ammunition it is a self-imposed tax and we pay billions of dollars or well we have paid millions of dollars i should say into those policies since the 1930s and i think it's actually 27 billion cumulatively okay it yes. might be into the bees I, yes. i'm not i don't have the current facts. So um, annually, it's millions of dollars, though, that go into those funds. And that is what um, our parks, forest service, fish and wildlife agencies are using to do projects around the around the nation. That is in addition to um, state license and tag mm -hmm. sales, which is funding 75% of statewide conservation budgets. Mm -hmm. So we are really funding and fueling the entire environmental debate and conservation debate with our own pocketbooks and with what we're doing, because these are all procedures, the North American model, this all came from hunters. So I just want to back it up just a little bit because there's a lot of you that hear these things, Pittman Robertson or PR Dollars or Dingell Johnson and like, what is this and how am I contributing? You may not even be aware, but if you hunt and you fish, you are a contributor. And that is something you should be proud of because you are actually boots on the ground, fueling the work that needs done around our country, en encouraging a better wild spaces, wildlife habitat, and a better future for our wildlife that call it home. Yes, and I think we are even credited with restoring the bald eagle, too. I was reading mm -hmm. back on the history of PR, and I was like, oh, we're even kind of responsible for, yeah. our predecessors, rather, are responsible for restoring bald eagles. So people don't know what lengths our dollars go to yeah. to restore imperiled species, all the commonly owned species, or commonly owned, commonly sought after species. <laughs> I have to correct myself, not commonly owned, but commonly well, sought they're, after species. They're public, they're public entities, Public correct? domain, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but those species were not, plentiful at the mm -hmm. turn of the 20th century and we don't ever want to return to that no. state where there was market game hunting and everything was hunted to extirpation and removal and almost extinction mm -hmm. so now we have elk we have white-tailed deer turkey i mean turkeys are suffering a little differently from not because of over hunting but because of other threats um particularly where i live in the southeast but we still have relatively healthy numbers of most commonly known species compared to this Correct. around this time last century give or take within a hundred year span so wildlife is doing much better mm -hmm. there's they're always putting out information these days of something now we have to worry about like are there forever chemicals in your fish or in your deer and we always kind of have to like look out for that and see like is that a concern do we have to like be concerned about that but for the most part wildlife are safe to consume we have regulated hunting seasons mm -hmm. they're needed we don't want to over hunt we had a horrible poaching case in virginia of this beautiful buck and oh, I saw that. Did, wasn't that heart-wrenching? Yes. I was so upset, and I was talking to people in our game department and in our natural resources agency, and I was like, this is so tragic. This is so sad. But it was because of, like, non-hunters who were enthusiasts and hunters. This guy was apprehended. He had accomplices. And uh, we were like, this could ruin hunting if we see people doing this, going, I don't know, 70 miles an hour, claiming he harvested this buck in his domain, but he didn't. He went to an off-limits place in downtown Richmond. Richmond is our capital in Virginia. And just poached this deer, stalked it, saw where it was, and, and found it and got it and claimed it as his own. So now he's facing penalties, thankfully. Yeah. So when we have rare but bad examples like that who are public, it does erode the trust. But I don't think it's going to be a dent in totality towards hunting. But we have to be careful. We have to fight back against you mm -hmm. know that kind of stuff because we have so many different obstacles. We have 
um, people misinterpreting what conservation is, what we've been talking about. We have this rewilding effort. We have people trying to remake state wildlife agencies. That's a movement your listeners need to be aware of. There's groups called like Wildlife for All and Washington Wildlife First who are trying to go after the people who are stewarded with making hunting season decisions or limits or... You your commissioners, your wildlife commissioners. Yes. So they're going after your wildlife commissioners. It's not only the politicians they're trying to take and, and influence. They want to influence the wildlife commissioners who should be somewhat attuned to and listening to or have some familiarity with hunting, fishing, and the activities that fuel conservation. So that's another And problem. the wildlife commissioners are, are placed in states by the governors. Yes. So those are appointed positions. They're not elected positions, and they're governor-appointed positions. So the governor of your state will directly affect uh, the politics of your state. So depending on uh, the politics that surround your state, whether you're Republican or Democrat, or uh, you know if you have someone who's kind of in between, um, more of a moderate stance, if you will, um, they will have a direct impact on how your wildlife manages and the policy that follows your state as well. Yeah, and we're seeing that unfold in Washington state. It's mm -hmm. been just very sad, but the people are fighting back, which is good. They're not giving up. They're not giving in to uh, these kind of remaking wildlife agency efforts. We have to look to Colorado this year. I know you've probably talked 100%. about Colorado. Colorado is where it's being played out this year mm -hmm. in 2024. And as goes Colorado, so goes other states, mm -hmm. I think. So why don't you expand on that with the, with the listeners and viewers a little yes. bit? Yeah, so even if you don't do big game hunting or you're just like, oh, I can't do mountain lion hunting, you kind of have to think of what are incremental threats to hunting or what does incremental elimination of hunting look like to you? How will it affect you in the chain of hunting? And so they're targeting these kind of charismatic, mm -hmm. megafauna, beautiful creatures. Nobody's... Iconic you know, species. Iconic species, absolutely. Emotionally charged species. Yes. And these species... They have to be managed. Everyone knows this who has some familiarity with hunting. Um, and, and yes, there's a lot of politically charged, emotionally charged kind of feelings about it. A lot of people who live in the cities who don't really have to encounter these kind of apex predators say it's So they're, they're going after mountain lions at this point yes. and then black bears as well. And then they've had the wolf reintroduction. Yes, the wolf reintroduction, yes. Yes. So Colorado, they're kind of having growing pains mm -hmm. um, as to, you know, do you keep the conservation course or do you go kind of this preservationist way and the governor there his husband is an anti-hunter and his yes. husband has been influencing going back right. to the commissioners influencing picks so i was seeing recently there was someone tied to the natural resources defense council they're not a very pro hunting organ outfit um some other type of like maybe humane society person mm -hmm. uh, or affiliate so they've been stacking in colorado commissioners. the board commissioners with these anti-hunters who want to divorce hunters and anglers from these critical management mm -hmm. decisions. So I, I always urge people on my podcast through my writings, you have to look to see what's happening here. Because yes, federal elections matter, statewide elections matter, but who your governor is selecting For to oversee <laughs> these positions is extremely critical. Um, and I don't know how if that could influence elections mm -hmm. in the future, but what was it? We were at the CSF banquet, and it was very interesting. Jeff Crane, president of the organization, mm -hmm. had said something to the effect that 74% of hunters, sportsmen, I don't know if it was one don't state. Vote, they vote. don't vote. They're not registered to vote. Actually, it's Rob I was Keck, shocked. I think, that said that. Yeah, Rob Keck, sorry, yeah, not, not Keck, Jeff. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he did, yes. And I was shocked. I was like, and And it's what? enough to sway an election. It it's is. A, it's enough to sway a win or miss or a win or, or lose election. And um, it's actually a staggering thought that, you know, a couple hundred thousand hunters and anglers mm -hmm. could really change the course of our of our um, of our country and how important it is to get involved. The number one thing we should all be doing is registering to vote. And number two, actually getting out and voting mm -hmm. if you're not doing it already. Mm -hmm. it's, it's mission critical, um, which, you know, we've talked about for a variety of reasons. So let's rein this in a little bit. Um, we've talked about some state policy, some state politics that we can get involved in, or at least kind of keep a pulse of mm -hmm. um, that we can have, t you know, some inner, inner, inner um, interjection or hopefully some kind of recourse or influence on. Let's talk about what you're doing with women. Yes. So I recently took over as Independent Women's Forum's director for our Center for Energy and Conservation. It's a mouthful. But I am kind of the lead person in our organization. We do a lot with women's issues, protecting women's spaces, uh, making sure women are informed on their decisions relating to their pocketbooks, energy decisions, national security, the whole gamut. So I've been tasked and I have the honor of leading our conservation policy. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to inject, you know, the multiple use mandate, making sure that's upheld, um, why public lands are critical property rights too because that's extremely important as well and, and the kind of balance between the two are kind of a mutual respect mm -hmm. for two whenever those two might come in conflict with one another but also looking out for legislation that could be good or legislation that could be bad 
um, just kind of like taking all that I've been doing, but now being able to communicate it mm -hmm. to like a wider audience and, and showcase, you know, even on the energy side, a lot of people, um, I know energy is not so much related to your podcast, but I've met a lot of people in the energy industry, whether they're in conventional, sometimes renewable, nuclear, what have you. A lot of sportsmen and women work in these very important decisions. You live in Wyoming. You know yeah. how important energy is. It's 50% of the economy. Um, in many of these Western states, you'll find an overlap between sportsmen and women working in energy. And they get a lot of bad rap um, with respect to that. But having interviewed people, having met people, I can translate, you know, talking to stakeholders that I've spoken to before and meeting new stakeholders, including women. A lot of women work in energy and conservation yes. in this overlap. And so just trying to translate that through policy work, we, we most are, not, we're not releasing like papers all the time or white papers. I have done some policy focuses and I do a lot of writing and op-eds, but we're trying to be, translate policy very easily into media format, digestible format, and inform women, you know, all over the country, whether it's something federally being handed down um, or something more state specific, what is going on? So sportsmen and women have a voice in me, especially mm -hmm. sportswomen, someone who understands, someone yeah. who lives this, someone who tries to, um, you know, translate our ideas. So you have an ally in me in Washington, um, an even stronger, more affirmed voice, because uh, we have great people and the, the gentlemen do well, but sometimes it takes a little bit of a feminine touch uh, for, for translating a word to women, because women sometimes relate better to other women yes. in these niches. So if I can help, you know, shape policy or involve women like yourself, you know, in different things, or I may be tasked with bringing, you know, women like you to come mm -hmm. to hearings. I'll have people in Congress, uh, staffers or members be like, Gabriella, who do you know that could be a perfect, you know, person to, to testify or do this? So I, I could either, I might even testify mm -hmm. <laughs> potentially, but they even ask me for like stakeholders. Who can we engage? So if I can be of help to anyone listening and watching, you know, about trying to get more involved in the, the federal or state process. We're trying to do that too because we have a, a education outfit, which is our forum. We have our voice side, which is where we can weigh in on legislation, not endorse candidates, but weigh in on like good or bad legislation, mm -hmm. state and federally. And then we have a network called Independent Women's Network. So you can join the network. We have a free and a paid version. And we're really animating and activating women across a whole slew of issues. And that, that network way. actually even has like an Instagram page that you guys we can do. follow. And, and All social media, yes. Well, and it's really great because a lot of these women, they're behind... The lines, right? They're they're there every day fighting, and they're not on the forefront. So you're not seeing them visually. The optic of the work that they're doing is not as easily recognized. And so when you go to that Independent Women's Forum Instagram page, you can connect and find out who these women are that are really down and dirty, like doing the work that we need and shining a light on good, bad, or otherwise that legislators are doing works that what's happening, um, bills that might be coming, you know, onto the table that we're not aware of things that are you know um, lobbyists maybe are trying to slip under yes. under the radar and so you can find who these women are and you can follow them and I I have found some really dynamic ladies and personalities um, that I enjoy following because of that network and so I encourage all of you out there get on Instagram follow their page and then you know if a woman inspires you or you want to learn or hear more about what she's doing they usually link her or tag her and yes. then you can follow that um, piece of legislation or whatever whatever she's working on or whatever entity she's working with or agents she's associated with you can follow along on that and I think it's really important that we build up these women mm -hmm. that are doing the work because um, they are really laying the foundation for the rest of us yes and I'm trying with energy and conservation to do that so I hope at some point I can involve you mm -hmm. because a lot of my colleagues are like we need to engage the sports women more I'm like yes we do and I know mm -hmm. the perfect people to, to involve in that endeavor yeah. and, I'm, and I'm also going to be launching very soon a new podcast not taking away from anything I'm currently doing but I'm working with a good friend of mine it's going to be called the sports women show mm -hmm. I would love to have you on yes, to talk about course. it go really dive into the d weeds of you know hunting and fishing um, why that animates you so much so that's going to be coming down very soon I think March 1st I can tell Fantastic. you here we're going to be launching that hopefully then um, so like I have my pulse on different things and no this gig has just been so much fun and I still do my conservation nation video series we have an alaska piece coming mm -hmm. out very soon we've done a lot with grizzly bear conservation i've talked to women i've talked to men um so i have a lot of stuff in the works and it's just so much fun to be able to come back to mm -hmm. sei uh, this time i'm coming as media not so much for work but i'm still making some networking mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. of course but I, I did a lot of reporting writing and i'm going to be 
you know, publishing a few pieces, video, blog, uh, podcast from the show because I don't like just taking credentials and not coming away with any yeah. content because I hate that. Like as a reporter, I'm like, they went out of their way to give me credentials. It's yeah. expensive to come here. You got to deliver. So I'll be having some pieces from here. But no, IWF, IW Voice, uh, Independent Women's Network in terms of my day job. Yes, I think it's important. If you care about energy, conservation, hunting, you want a voice in Washington um, who can represent you, I want to do my best and, and really you know, communicate that because we are really upping the ante with those sportsmen's issues. And I actually wrote a letter in support of the Explorer Act, the Film Act. Remember we were talking mm -hmm. about filming on mm -hmm. public lands? Mm -hmm. We may see some reforms there. So something as simple as that well, I think is important. Well, like, some of the state agencies um, are really easy to work with. BLM basically has, you know, like I've contacted Wyoming BLM and they're like, look, we, we're not requiring you to do a film permit for what you're doing with your husband any longer. And if somebody gives you a hard time, you give them my name and number, have them call us down That's here awesome. at the BLM office. In Oregon, I actually encountered the same thing. In years past, I've had to get film permits on BLM. The last, I would say, two or three years on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land, I've not had to have film permits. National Forest now, oh. on the other hand, Oof. that has been a disaster. And, and for example, those of you listening or watching that don't know, what we're referring to is when I go out and I film a hunt with my cameraman and my husband and my dad, and it's just us, we have to have a firm permit and we have to have insurance. And I believe the policy is like a $1.5 to $2 million insurance policy. I remember we, seeing that on an application. We have yeah. to list the forest office as additional insured on mm. our insurance policy. And um, so when, when my producer flies a drone, he has to be a licensed drone pilot, which is fine because he is. We, we're all on the up and up. But then it's a daily fee on top of that for, they charge you for your setup days, setup days. Mm -hmm. um, they charge you for travel days. They, they charge you. And last year, for example, um, I started trying to acquire my film permit for fall hunting season in May. <laughs> and I got it the day I went in the field in September. <laughs> Now, granted, the lady that I was working with was very gracious. She's like, look, you know, let's block out how many days you're going to film because it was a date span over two months. I wasn't exactly sure um, what days I'd be filming because <clears throat> weather and other variables. And she did work with me and it was like, okay, well, we'll block you out. In this date span, you, you have five days in September from, you know, the 15th to the 30th or whatever it is, right? And then you can select your days based off of conditions. Um, and then same thing in October. However, the problem is, is the process. Yes. Um, you have to identify where you're going. You have to do all of these things. And it's literally like me, oftentimes it's just me and my cameraman. It's not a production studio. It's, it's a not low a impact film set. project. It's a low impact film project. And it's actually, you know, a lot of times benefiting local economies as mm -hmm. well because that publicity for hunting and fishing hopefully encourages other people to buy hunting and fishing licenses and travel. And so it actually is, is um, really great for ecotourism, but it's really difficult for a lot of independent content creators like myself to do. Many content creators don't even go through the process. Oh, and no. technically, yeah. there can be reprimand through the U.S. government on that side and, and, and pretty hefty penalties if they're caught on public land filming without a permit. So I am really, really, really careful, really aware, and go through the steps of doing it, pay for the insurance. The insurance is very expensive every year. Um, but I haven't had to pay insurance. I, I had a connection through the Montana State Legislature, and he's like, I'll talk to my lady in this uh, Forest Service thing. And she's like, no, we just waived it. It's all good because you trust. You, we went through the hoops. But it shouldn't have to be us it going through the, ho the hoops. hoops. And you shouldn't have to be paying that kind of money. Especially, but I think the, the, film act, or the Film Act provision in the Explore Act says it's a, a group of six or fewer people. Yes. And then now they can't charge you or they can't make you go through the fee. If it were to be adopted, um, I think it still has to be voted on the floor house and then go through the Senate. But there is an appetite to reform it. I've seen bipartisan support for it. It's like something as simple as that. But the thing is, it's even stricter than like that. So they're going off of a basis because of this 22 Supreme or not Supreme Court, but like lower court decision that basically says that if you're filming on even your smartphone and you may potentially monetize that video, you're engaged in a commercial film That's project. Correct. So to me, if you have a YouTube channel that yeah. you're monetizing, you are now a commercial producer. So you'll have to go through the hoops, but I see it. Or you could be penalized. Yes. Yeah. You could, you could be penalized. You'll have to go through the hoops, but I see it as an attack somewhat on public lands access because you're going to just, 
<coughs> destroy that ability of people to want to enjoy. I'm not saying like be like an idiot with a selfie stick and you know deface public lands and and ruin. And, and do that. No, no. Like being conscious about your surroundings, filming with respect, etc. But like to deter people from filming with your phone or even just taking a still mm -hmm. and have that class of be classified as commercial is such a strict standard. I don't even know where they're well, coming up with that. Well, it's the change in media, the, the change of media production um, over the last, you know, it's been such a short yeah. time. The, the shift even a decade. Been, yeah, it's been, it's the, the legislation hasn't kept up with what we're they doing. don't know how to deal with technology yeah. and modern. So, so, so. We're, that's where we're facing right now, and, and there's a lot of people on the ground, hopefully, working on that, and, and you know, keep us something all I'm up, keeping posted yeah, on. Yes, keep us all updated. How can people find you if they want to connect with you and they want to um, get more in, involved or you know, pay a little bit better attention to what's going on? IWF.org is a great resource for my work. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, District of Conservation podcast, and then my website. GabriellaHoffman.com. If you're not sure where to follow me or want to follow my writings, all there, simply yeah. out there. And uh, it's been fun chatting well, with you, Chrissy. And we could talk for hours. I know. She's an adult onset hunter. I am, yeah. And I love her story, which is it lends itself really well to the Women Go Hunt mission of why SCI has Women Go Hunt. We want to get women that maybe weren't raised in a hunting or fishing family and welcome them into this space. It's not so important what we're doing now as hunters. It's important of how we got started and that we help inspire that next person, whether they be a kid, a woman, a man, um, 20, 50, 80 years old. If you want to get in the outdoors, we want to create that space where you're welcome and you feel confident and have great tools to do so. So um, that's part of what Women Go Hunt is, specifically on the women's side. Um, and I want to thank our partners. Safari Club International is a great partner of the podcast. Ruger is a great partner of the podcast. Onyx Hunt. And I want to make sure you guys go to my website. Go to PursueTheWild.com. You can watch my videos, stream them. You can listen to my YouTube channel. Um, or excuse me, you can listen to my podcast. And then also, if you guys click the discount tab, I have lots of great discounts from my partners. I want you all to get the best deals possible on the best gear. So go to PursueTheWild.com, click discounts for that. And we appreciate you all tuning in at SCI convention here in Nashville. we got a busy week. Gabriella and I are going to the Women's Mix and Mingle right now. So next year, if you come to SCI, join us Saturday mornings at the Women's Mix and Mingle here. We look forward to seeing you all soon. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.